Hey everyone, today I'm excited to take you on a journey into the Australian sci-fi film, The Osiris Child, also known as Science Fiction Volume 1, The Osiris Child. Directed by Shane Abbas, the film stars Kellen Lutz as Cy, a cynical drifter, and Luke Ford as Kane, a disillusioned soldier. The plot centers on a future global crisis that plunges humanity into chaos. Cy, a resourceful drifter, encounters a desperate plea for help from Kane, a soldier haunted by his past. Kane's daughter, believed to be dead, is held captive by a powerful military contractor. Forced to trust each other, Cy and Kane embark on a perilous mission to rescue her and uncover the truth behind the escalating conflict. Will Cy and Kane defy the odds and save the day? Join me in this recap to unravel the story and discover the answers together. Please subscribe to my channel to stay updated with all the exciting content coming your way. All right, let's begin. In the distant future, humanity has begun colonizing the universe. The Exor Corporation, an off-world military contractor, operates from a massive complex in the sky above the desolate planet of Osiris, home to a penal colony in its capital city. A military base, the Flotilla, supports these new settlements. Lieutenant Kane Somerville, a war hero plagued by guilt from a past mission gone wrong, works for Exor. His mistake during an early combat mission resulted in the deaths of nearly his entire crew. Although he was accused of substance abuse, his decorated career as a fighter pilot led to his pardon. However, the incident strained his relationship with his family. Living in the flotilla, Kane finds it challenging to spend time with his 11-year-old daughter, Indy. Kane takes Indy on a ride through Osiris's desert, but she is unimpressed by the barren landscape. She mentions her mother's belief that Kane is running away, but he deflects, expressing pride in his role in building humanity's future. To bond with her, he teaches her to shoot with his weapon before returning to the bunkers. Indy is then sent to Osiris City to stay with a nanny, as she is not allowed in the flotilla. Kane promises to return in a week and encourages her to call him anytime. The following morning, Kane's AI assistant, Travis, wakes him and prepares his breakfast while playing messages. He ignores those from his coworker and wife, but listens to Indy's message while reviewing reports. The message is abruptly cut off, and when Kane asks Travis to restore it, the AI reports that communications to the surface are disrupted due to disturbances in the prison. General Linux oversees the Exor complex and focuses more on her status than the colonists' lives. General Linux receives a status report after the prison breach reveals that Exor's creatures have infiltrated and killed prisoners. The outer cities are also overrun, and it's only a matter of time before the monsters decimate the surface population. While the Colonel wants to save lives, Linux fears the damage to Exor's reputation. She convenes a meeting, including Kane, but lies about the situation. She claims the prisoners have rioted and possessed a lethal virus, threatening to release it in the capital if Exor intervenes. To prevent this, Linux invokes Protocol 84, which mandates the colony's destruction. She insists that if the prisoners find out, they might negotiate a better deal. They have 23 hours to resolve the issue, and Linux assures everyone that the people in the capital and employees' families will be safe. After the meeting, Linux orders the colonel to monitor the attendees for unusual activity and isolate them if necessary. Kane, desperate after hearing the news, tries to contact Indy but fails. When he asks Travis for details on the prison incident, he learns the information is classified. The colonel reveals the truth out of friendship. There is no virus. Exor has been developing creatures called Ragged for use in new colonies. The monsters have escaped and are heading towards the central city. In 23 hours, Exor plans to blow up the reactors to contain the outbreak. Enraged by the deception and the risk to his family, Kane confronts the Colonel but realizes there is no time to argue. The Colonel informs him that the hangar bay will be locked in 20 minutes, preventing anyone from entering or leaving. Using his piloting skills, Kane steals a ship and expertly evades the pursuing officers as he escapes the station. As Kane pushes his ship to exceed G-Force to evade the last Exor guard, he begins to lose consciousness. The emergency system activates, ejecting his seat. Regaining his senses just in time, Kane removes his seatbelt and deploys his parachute, 
landing safely in the water. However, upon standing, he is knocked out by a mysterious figure. Kane awakens to find himself at gunpoint, held by Cy Lombrock, who dragged him from the water. Kane attempts to lie, claiming the prisoners have access to the reactors. But Cy, a former prison nurse, knows better. Kane then reveals the truth. The planet is set to explode, and he needs to save his daughter, Indy, in the capital. He offers Cy access to a safety bunker in exchange for his help. Cy agrees. A flashback shows Cy as a prisoner in the planet's jail, discussing an escape plan with inmates Vim and Charles based on information from another prisoner, Clarence. Charles is skeptical, considering it a suicide mission, but Cy insists it's their only chance. They agree once they confirm that Bostock and his group are also in. The next step requires them to be in solitary confinement. Clarence tries to get sent there, but is instead brought before Warden Mordain, who mocks his religious beliefs and beats him. Meanwhile, Cy starts a fight in the mess hall, which Warden and the guards allow to continue as long as the crowd behaves. Charles disrupts this by injuring the man attacking Cy, inciting a riot. The guards intervene and the prisoners are sent to solitary, which consists of rotating cells with flashing lights that can drive prisoners mad. Cy is also placed there until Warden removes him and Vim for a particular purpose. Back in the present, Cy tells Kane they won't be able to reach the capital on foot in time. Kane suggests they head to a contraband outpost beyond the mountains to find a vehicle. Their conversation is cut short when ships fly overhead, forcing Kane and Cy to hide in the tall grass. It's clear that Exor is already searching for Kane. Shortly after, they reach a bar at the outpost where Jip and Bill entertain themselves by throwing knives at a human-shaped target. Kane approaches them to request a ride, but they are angered by the interruption. Jip threatens Kane with a knife, and Bill challenges him. Cy explains that Kane is an Exor defector who wants to reunite with his family. He offers to pay them 20 grand for the trip. Bill agrees, provided Kane can pass Jip's test, which involves getting high and hitting the target with a knife. Kane's perfect aim satisfies them, and they agree to take a detour to purchase weapons before leaving. In a flashback to the prison, Vim awakens in a cage with a monster approaching. The creature injects him with a dangerous substance. Sai hears Vim screams as he wakes in a nearby cage. Warden explains Exor's terraforming project, revealing they mutate prisoners into adaptive creatures. Suddenly, Sai is dropped into another room where Bostock awaits, having executed their escape plan. Bostock provides clothes and fake IDs, including one identifying Sai as a nurse. Their preparations are interrupted by Charles, who declares it's time to unleash chaos. A riot ensues as the mutated prisoners attack, including Vim, who now kills Warden. Bostock and Charles head for the capital, but Sai opts to go to the opera, separating from the group. Another flashback shows Sai being sentenced to 20 years for breaching the code and betraying public trust. In the present, Kane and Sai are waiting for the weapons they ordered, delivered by Mandel and Hopper, who demand 30 grand as payment. Kane pays the demanded amount and the group leaves. Out of sight, Mandel and Hopper celebrate their newfound wealth. However, their joy is short-lived as they notice monsters approaching. Despite their attempts to fend off the creatures by shooting through the windows, the monsters break in. In a desperate move, Hopper detonates a grenade. Later, Kane discusses the monsters in the impending bomb detonation with the group on the bus. They engage in a philosophical conversation about destiny, consequences, and the ethics of using prisoners for free labor. As they reach Osiris, they find the city in chaos, overrun by monsters attacking and infecting people. Armed, the group splits up. Kane and Sai head to find Indy, while Jip and Bill provide cover and protect the bus. Kane and Sai enter the building where Indy lives and encounter a neighbor who hasn't seen her. They break into Indy's apartment to find the nanny dead, but Indy is safe in a closet. Kane reassures Indy, telling her the nanny went home to shield her from the harsh reality. The trio attempts to take the stairs, but are blocked by a monster, forcing them to find another escape route. Meanwhile, Jip drags an injured Bill back into the bus, desperately searching for a first aid kit. Unable to find one, she tearfully watches Bill die in her arms. Kane, 
Sai, and Indy reached the building's roof and locked the door behind them. With no other options, Sai jumps off the roof with Indy, landing safely on the bus. Kane follows but almost falls, saved by Sai pulling him up. They bang on the hatch, pleading with Jip to let them in. Initially hesitant and due to Bill's death, Jip eventually opens the hatch. Once inside, Jip starts the bus while Sai covers Bill's body with a blanket. Kane explains the situation to Indy and apologizes for not being more present in her life. Indy forgives Kane, who then gives Jip directions to the bunker and shares the access code with everyone. Meanwhile, Linux initiates Protocol 84 at the Exor Complex and learns of a bus heading towards one of their bunkers. She dispatches a ship to intercept it. Indy spots the ship, prompting Kane to tell Jip not to take the turn to avoid detection. The ship eventually leaves, and Jip turns towards the bunker. Just as they near their destination, the ship reappears and opens fire, exhausting its ammo before departing. Kane and Jip are killed in the attack, but Sai and Indy survive. Despite Indy's reluctance to leave her father, Sai carries her off the bus, aiming for the bunker. They encounter a monster in the caves, and while Sai kills it, he is infected by its tongue. They reach the bunker entrance, and Indy enters the code, allowing them to get inside just as the planet is bombed. Sai begins to transform into a monster and asks Indy to find something sharp so he can end his life. Indy refuses, unable to do this alone, and stays with him as he mutates. A flashback shows Sai's past as a nurse on Earth. He suffers a breakdown when his wife and daughter are brought to the hospital after an accident and do not survive. Sai abuses his position to attack the man responsible for the accident before security stops him. In the present, days after the explosion, two explorers discover the bunker and spot Indy in a spacesuit. They are attacked by the mutated Sai, who retains some rationality thanks to Indy. After killing one explorer, they interrogate the other. The explorer reveals that the flotilla has been recalled to Earth and that the official story is the prisoners revolted, causing a reactor meltdown with no survivors. Indy demands the explorer take her and Sai to the flotilla undetected, and the woman reluctantly agrees. They board the explorer's ship and Indy communicates with Sai through sign language, reassuring him that they are finally going home. She pets his head and holds his hand, saying goodbye to her father. What are your thoughts on the film's story? Please share your comments below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more captivating stories like this. See you in the following video.